Welcome, everybody, to RealCast. This is the first of a series of um, video podcasts that we'll be putting together each week on a Friday, just looking and sharing at some of the insights that, that we've seen during the week, um, and also looking forward a little bit towards um, some of the news agendas that you might have for next week. Um, so first of all, let's, let's introduce us. Um, my name's Richard Betts. Um, I'm the group publisher at Real Asset Media. Um, and we also have uh, Judy, James, and Nicole. Um, Judy, just, just, uh, just explain a little bit about you and then we'll, we'll also talk to, to James and Nicole. Judy. Okay. So I'm Judy Sebus. I'm a director of Belliac Communications in Amsterdam. Um, and we serve a, a range of uh, clients um, in the Dutch market as well as in the, the European uh, uh, real estate market. Great. Nicole. Uh, I'm Nicole Dines. I'm a writer and editor with Real Asset Media, and I've been focusing on the European real estate market, and I write, um, I write many stories about it and follow our briefings, our investment briefings as well. James. Hi, I'm James Wallace. Um, I'm also a reporter with... Uh, Real Asset Media and have been writing on real estate for about 15 years, as well as financial markets that were extensively on the global financial crisis uh, and other sectors too. And what's great is, so we, we, we've got James here also um, uh, is from Thailand. Nicole and I are, are based out of London and Judy is joining us from Amsterdam. Um, maybe let's, um, let's, let's just pick up on, on some of the, the topics that, that, that we've seen. Um, I mean, Judy, in, in terms of you're obviously looking at the news flow the whole time based out of Amsterdam. Um, just just tell us a little bit more about what, what you're seeing, what, what you're thinking. Well, I mean, there's an awful lot happening. Uh, it's hard to uh, keep up with everything. But what, what I'm seeing is that uh, everybody's trying to find direction in this market. And uh, I think uh, your uh, online event uh, that you had this week was, uh, was a very good uh, example of how um, the, the sector is uh, changing very fast on the one hand and uh, on the other, uh, the real estate sector, the way we work. Um, and on the other hand, you know, the search for information, you brought together some, uh, some uh, great minds who were uh, looking at the future um, and trying to, uh, to give us some direction. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, one of the things that I also thought about that was it's just extraordinary how fast paced this particular crisis is um, in the sense that we, we'd got Andrew Burrell there from Capital Economics just talking about the three million um, in mm -hmm. terms of unemployment in the US figures mm -hmm. that have just come through. And that's already jumped to six, almost almost seven million. So just the, the pace of this is just yeah. extraordinary, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, actually, I mean, the sort of con the macro context to that uh, is that there's been a flood of support measures from governments and central banks across the globe. And that's obviously together, they're coordinated to, 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 to cushion the impact uh, at the economies at large, but for our sector, for occupiers, landlords and lenders, but it's not going to spare a, a period of severe pain. I mean, European economies are heading for a recession and it potentially could be worse than the one uh, during the global financial crisis. And, and in reference to the, the US uh, job losses, actually, I think the, the numbers were 6.6 .6 million just last week and it's 9.9 .9 million for the last two weeks, which is apparently uh, deeper than the entirety of um, redundancy request, payment requests during the Great Depression. So, and you add to the forecasts for the first week of April of between four and five million further U.S. job losses. This is a, a an, an abrupt global synchronized demand shock, and it's going to percolate through uh, real estate markets, and it creates incredible stress at a time um, when um, uh, there's been low economic growth, particularly in Europe, for a while. So this is, it's not just the US, of course, that's reporting these uh, massive uh, unemployment numbers. Uh, uh, four, four million uh, in uh, un, uh, looking for unemployment benefits in France. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Not, uh, one million in the UK, 800,000 in, uh, in Spain, uh, where, where they've already got an uh, unemployment rate of uh, 14%. So, um, and this is the relatively well-developed part of the world. Yeah, I mean, this, this pandemic has actually hit Europe and the world incredibly unevenly. And it's, it is unfortunate that among the worst hit in Europe thus far, it seemed to be some of those uh, countries that um, 
I have still struggled to kind of fully recover from the global financial crisis, obviously, particularly Italy. Well, Italy has uh, had a very good year last year in the real estate sector. It had a uh, huge um, growth, especially in the logistics sector, and it had a huge uh, number of international investment that went up 50%. It's also a market that's dominated by, by foreign investors. Uh, it's 84% last year. So the crisis hit the country, as you were saying, that was already weak, uh, had very sluggish growth, it was probably going to recession anyway. And obviously this has been precipitated events. So we, f we find ourselves with a, we initially with an economy that's obviously going to suffer terribly and it's going to hit particularly the sectors, so even like the logistics one that we're doing particularly mm. well. So it's a particularly bitter, bitter situation. There's obviously discussions around whether or not it's going to be a, a V-shaped recovery. I mean, certainly in the, in the session we held this week, there were slightly differing views about that, as you would expect, really, given that it's an unprecedented kind of crisis, really. Um, what's, what senses have you been hearing from the market in terms of whether or not this is you know, likely to be a, a three-month issue, whether this is gonna, the market's likely to come back in, in September? Um, have there been sort of differing views? I think uh, I think that it's still too too early to tell, but um, um, you know clearly we're in for a very sharp uh, slowdown uh, in the coming months. And uh, if you look at uh, RCA, I did a presentation uh, during your event. Um, if you look at the figures for for Asia um, for the first eleven uh, uh, weeks of the year. Um, they were down, uh, investment volumes, real estate investment volumes were down um, 50%. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is not to say that the rest of the world will follow the same pattern, but um, I think we can see that as a, as a proxy for what could happen in, uh, in Europe. Um, and, uh, uh, beyond, yeah, for the first couple of months in any case, I think we're, uh, we're in for some uh, very unpleasant surprises. And, and I was struck a little bit as well in, in the discussion, actually, about some of the feedback from um, Kevin Turpin at, at Colliers, just talking to their colleagues in, in China, especially, and that they were now going back to work. Um, and that although things had changed slightly, um, that they were still doing it in shifts to avoid there being significant chance of, of the virus recapturing again but but actually um, there was a lot more movement now and that's basically three to four months on which would suggest that here assuming or, or guessing that it goes in the same direction that then this is taking us through to june july certainly in the uk um, but it was just interesting to see that also there there'd been a, a bump in terms of retail um, and food and beverage, as I guess you'd expect, because people having been shut away for three months suddenly were excited at the prospect of going out again. Yeah, I mean, the, obviously the retail, leisure, hospitality sectors are probably going to be the biggest victims of this, um, of this pandemic. I think net, net operating income is expected to fall uh, drastically over the coming months across the retail sector. Um, a lot of uh, occupiers are seeking concessions and of course the governments uh, around Europe have tried to put in protective measures to sort of uh, save uh, and protect some of these vulnerable companies by changing insolvency laws, by uh, a moratorium on bankruptcy. However, um, uh, to get access to some of the direct financial support that governments have uh, uh, introduce it takes some time to get their capital and so there is a little bit of a kind of a race for survival in terms of how much liquidity do some of these struggling retail companies have to survive until they can actually get this uh, capital to keep them afloat and we've already seen in the UK that that, that uh, time is precious and some retailers have already gone under unfortunately. I mean the logistics market I think is also quite quite interesting in terms of the um, sectors because you've I've I've seen differing views on that really in some ways that there are uh, positives because um, there's obviously an increased move towards online but at the same time you've also got supply chains really beginning to be stretched. Mm. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing a, a bit of a um, you know the the, the logistics sector is uh, being affected as well, but um, some some parts of the the supply chain are being affected more than others. You know, obviously there's a, a huge uh, um, huge demand for food and uh, less demand for uh, the non-essentials uh, um, like the automotive industry is being uh, uh, hit pretty hard. Mm. Um, but 
long term, uh, uh, the research that we've seen um, from Prologis, for example, uh, shows that uh, supply chains, are, um, the reconfiguration that we're already seeing will possibly accelerate. And that, uh, for example, the, the, the just-in-time delivery um, mode, method that we've uh, seen for the last um, 30 to 40 years, you know, uh, suppliers have been moving towards um, becoming being leaner and meaner, you know, they want to be uh, as efficient as possible, and that doesn't work in a crisis. And I think there's a uh, uh, Prologis is predicting that there'll be a tipping point at uh, the tipping point that has already been reached will possibly be um, accelerated in, in the coming uh, period. I yeah, saw some research uh, from Engels and Volkers. They did a, not recent. They did a survey of, uh, or, you know, a flash survey, and uh, from that survey it came out that logistics sector were the most optimistic about the outlook. For, uh, they obviously see that it's short-term pain, but they're the most uh, optimistic about a rebound when this is over. Obviously, a lot will depend on how long these lockdown measures will last. Because if it's uh, if it's May, June, then you could uh, you know see a, a recovery beginning in the second half of the year. If they go on for six months, as some have said, uh, so it's very much out of out of you know companies' hands, out of the sector's hands. Uh, it's very much up to governments. And as James was saying earlier, uh, all these measures that governments are, are putting in, uh, some are more successful than others, some are more efficient than others. But, uh, but obviously they're not, they're not going to last forever. They're just uh, uh, you know, a sticking plaster of various sizes. But at some point, um, uh, it will, there will have to be a return to, to normality of some kind. And that's when, when the real situation will, will emerge of who survived and who hasn't. I mean, there, there are a couple of positive things from discussions I've had this week. I mean, we've been, I mean, one of the interesting things is that um, to a certain degree, this has driven innovation, particularly for us, which is before, if I was doing TV interviews, I would have to actually physically go there um, and interview them, take a camera crew with me. Um, whereas actually now I'm finding I can interview people wherever they are in the world um, because actually it's, it's possible. Um, but yeah, we're all better like using the technology that's been there all this time. And so it's actually making us sort of uh, re rethink how we... Um, connect and work. And I think that may be one of the sort of longer term uh, kind of uh, lessons from this is that um, we, we can actually work at distance very efficiently and effectively for some types of work. Yeah, and an interesting thing, it was, um, I was doing an interview with um, Hugo James at Alpha Real Capital. Um, and he was saying, obviously, that he's focused on, on very much the long term investment side, mm. but was also saying that particularly for, for some of the UK markets that um, what had previously maybe maybe could have been seen as an adversarial relationship between um, investors, landlords and, and tenants, there was an opportunity then to be able to change this in a way because everybody was um, everybody was in the same issue in a way and all therefore would have to work together. I think, this, um, I think this is a moment of truth for a lot of companies. You know, uh, a lot of companies have uh, drawn up uh, corporate and social responsibility uh, reports in recent years. I think, that, I think that the picture, Richard, though, is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, um, when you're looking at the kind of the interrelationships between sort of uh, tenants and landlords and lenders, it is coming under strain. And how, um, comp how, how that strain manifests and works through is dependent upon the solvency of those, uh, each of those three interconnected uh, institutions. Um, if you have a big stable landlord with access to deep liquidity, like the bigger, uh, more, um, uh, the, the stronger um, REITs, then they can afford to sort of say to their tenants, okay, don't pay your quarterly rent in March, spread it over the subsequent six months, like I believe um, British Land did. But, but there are other landlords, even of scale, like Into, that came into this pandemic crisis yeah. already uh, near the brink. And so they can't afford to be benevolent, if you like. And then you look at the smaller property investors who maybe have uh, more expensive uh, and restrictive uh, covenant terms and debt headroom from their lenders that for their own self-protection uh, need to push back hard onto the occupiers who don't pay them rent. And so it's nice to think that we're all going to uh, be accommodating for each other, but that's a function of the individual stresses within these complex chains. 
I think it was a point that was made uh, in the online briefing we had that um, it's, it, it is a mistake to think that all landlords are rich and, and powerful and all uh, occupiers, you know, all tenants are, are in trouble. It can, you can have very large um, uh, tenants who are quite, uh, quite strong and very small landlords who are in dire straits. So the picture right. is nuanced, as James said. And, uh, and of course, a point was made also that these government interventions um, uh, to to like force landlords to to give um, rent holidays to their tenants uh, obviously are done for the, all the right reasons but can also distort the market because uh, it, it is bringing outside you know state into government inventory into the private sector and that that is something that also will be difficult to extricate ourselves from in in months uh, in months to come when things return to normal yeah i think overall the picture is mixed i mean there will be some sort of um uh flexibility offered by the more stable lenders and the more stable and the bigger uh, landlords, but there'll also be a lot of um, strain. Uh, and that's why it's important for a lot of, a lot of uh, markets have this uh, temporary moratorium on um, insolvency proceedings or bankruptcy proceedings on the continent, because um, a lot of these uh, companies have just had their, like the vast bulk, if not entirely, their, their revenues just stop. Uh, and how do you, if you're running on sort of um, thin margins with a, a, um, a limited amount of dead headroom. How do you survive in, in, in the interim when you have to uh, pay your rent, pay your service charges, pay your staff um, uh, be, before you get access to the emergency funding? I mean, the, the gap of time is acutely stressful for certain companies in those situations. And they have choices to make which are unpleasant. Do I pay my landlord the rent or do I pay my staff their wages? And these are real questions that some occupiers are asking at the moment. Uh, that, that's, all, that's definitely true. What, what, I'm, what I'm also seeing and what I'm uh, encouraged about is the, the innovation we're seeing and the, the initiatives uh, to help uh, the, the small, the small uh, um, shop owner on the corner. And uh, like in our case, uh, uh, we had a virtual um, uh, press lunch uh, this week and we um, uh, supplied our, uh, the journalists who took part with the... Uh, with a lunch um, from our local uh, um, supplier, and uh, we had them brought round to, by uh, our taxi chauffeur, who's been out of work for the last three weeks. So we're see, I'm seeing, you know, these sort of initiatives, but others as well that are, you know, there's 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 more solidarity, it seems, in this uh, crisis than there was in the GFC. And that's and that's interesting, um, Nicole, because there was something you wanted to pick up on that as well. Um, yes, absolutely. The, 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 another positive uh, that people seem to highlight quite rightly is that uh, it is not the same as the GFC. There's a very yeah. different, um, uh, there are very different fundamentals, stronger fundamentals for the real estate sector than it is, uh, and uh, and also it's a different crisis because it's, it is an invisible enemy that has hit everybody uh, in the same way. In the UK, most uh, notably, it has, uh, it has hit many so-called people but also the heir to the throne and the prime minister so uh, it is clear to everyone that it's no one's fault and it's so it is a crisis that could unite people rather than divide society as as, as, as happened very visibly in the financial crisis when the bankers were the culprits and, uh, and it was the rich versus the poor the haves versus the have-nots so uh, if we want to look at the positives which we definitely should do um, I think this crisis could bring society together. We've seen many examples of, of, of it in small and big ways. Uh, so that's something to, to positive to, to keep hold of for the future. And just looking into, just looking into the next week, um, we, we, I guess we'll probably see Q1 figures starting mm. to come through. Um, it's been interesting that there are still transactions coming through and, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not those slow down. There was also discussions about are we likely to see more mergers and acquisitions, um, various things. But I suppose what what are we expecting to see for for next week? Well, actually, the the the, the top is uh, is actually transaction volumes. Um, I, what what we can surmise at this stage from uh, um, from how the first quarter has gone is it might well be a quarter of three thirds in each sequential month. Um, the, the reality of the scale and breadth of the pandemic became more and more apparent, um, first on the periphery, just pockets of Europe, and then, then rapidly in March globally. So I think each of the three individual months of Q1 will show that story. Uh, but most people expect that there's this far greater 
pain in that respect to come in Q2. So while there were always um, positives to sort of try to try to draw out of these situations, I, I think the reality is is that the the Q2 will be much worse than we've already experienced, and that many in the market are sort of bracing for this kind of new reality. Actually, I have seen predictions of minus forty percent transaction volumes in Q1. We'll see when the figures come out, but uh, but certainly I agree with James that uh, Q2. I think everyone is bracing themselves for 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 a very steep fall. So Thanks, we'll look forward to seeing what the uh, I guess what those numbers are next week um, and look forward to having this same discussion next week and, and sharing that with everybody. Uh, in the meantime, um, from all of us, um, stay safe, um, stay indoors. Thank you. Thanks, Richard.